Good morning. It's good to see you this morning here online. We worship today with the members of the congregation of St Nicholas Methodist Church, Exminster Methodist Church and Axminster Methodist Church. It's good to unite in this way. Today we, we meet, as it were, on the Sunday following Epiphany. So our subject, as you can see, is about the Magi, the wise men who came to visit Jesus. So come, let us worship the Lord. Lord Jesus, may your light shine our way, as once it guided the steps of the Magi, that we too may be led into your presence and worship you, the child of Mary, the word of the Father, King of the nations, Saviour of humankind, to whom be glory forever. Amen. We sing the hymn, Brightest and Best of the Sons of the Morning. Come, let's, let's pray together on this Sunday when we consider the greatest gift of all, the gift of Jesus, our Saviour. Let us pray. Holy God, you make our joy into laughter, our words into song, and our sorrow into hope. This is the power of love. This is the power of your presence. You are the giver of all life. We worship and adore you. Amen. And the collect for today. Creator of the heavens, who led the Magi by a star to worship the Christ child, 
guide us and sustain us, that we may find our journey's end in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And so as we pray, we bring our confession to the Lord. Let us pray. Great and gracious God, we come to you hungry and thirsty. We confess that we have turned from you, the true source of living water. We confess that we have rejected you, our true spiritual nourishment. We have sinned against you in thought, word and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. From our hunger and thirst draw us back to you. In your mercy forgive us. Welcome us back. Restore and refill us. Rekindle our love for you and your ways. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hear the good news of the psalmist proclamation. If I say, surely the darkness will overwhelm me and light around me will be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. And the night is as bright as the day. The God who promised never to leave us or forsake us has come to us in Jesus Christ, who binds up the brokenhearted, heals our infirmities and relieves our burden of sin. So arise, shine, for your light has come. May the forgiveness of Christ be yours, and the glory of the Lord be risen within you. Thanks be to God. Amen. And so we pray together the prayer that Jesus gave us by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way, and behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them, until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy, and going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then, opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. We sing the carol, Love came down 
at Christmas. Lord, speak your truth to our hearts today. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Let's just pick up two verses from the story of the wise men coming to see Jesus. When they saw the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. And on entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid homage to him. Then opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold, of frankincense and myrrh. This is perhaps one of the greatest stories, full of drama, radiance and mystery. We know from the slaughter of the innocents that there were a number of male children born around Bethlehem at that time. So, so what makes this child so special? Yes, the story of the wise men is telling us that in the birth of this child, God is doing something unsurpassable, of unsurpassable significance, something that transforms the darkness of the human story into hope and light. Everything serves this divine project. You see, nature is shown to be at this child's service in the form of the star. The wise men from the East stand for the, all the nations. The world of dreams is orchestrated to assist them. And the safe escape of the travellers indicates that evil is overcome by good. The concluding act of this drama is just two verses, yet it can be broken down into six distinct actions. Just think about it. The major I come. First they saw. Second, they stopped. Thirdly, they were overwhelmed. Fourth, they entered the house. Fifth, they knelt and prayed, paid homage. Sixth, they offered their gifts. Let's dig a little deeper into the drama script of the Epiphany. They saw. To perceive, to see beyond the physical, to take in the significance of what they saw. It is said that seeing is believing. But seeing the truth of God's unfolding salvation plan is perhaps another dimension altogether. Is it all to do with perception? The story is told of two liberal sociologists who were walking down the street. They saw a man lying unconscious in the, in, and covered in cuts and bruises from a terrible mugging. And one of the sociologists turned to his colleague and said, whoever did this terrible deed really needs our help. Missing the whole point, seeing but not perceiving the need. They stopped. Have you ever viewed something that has taken your breath away, that stops you in your tracks, that once you have stopped, you stand there changed, even though you do not fully understand what it is that you see? What stops you in your tracks? And having stopped, how do you consider your next move? Watchman Nee relates a story from one of his experiences as a Christian leader in China. 
a group of young Christian brothers were gathered together to take a swim into the many creeks that are found around the countryside there. Since most of them were not good swimmers, they carefully remained close to the banks so that they would not get into the deep water and get in above their heads. One of the brothers got out a little too far and began to struggle in the deep water. Realising the predicament, he began to cry out to his neighbours, who by now were out of the water drying themselves off. Help, save me, he yelled, and all the while thrashing his arms and legs in a futile attempt to keep his head above the water. Brother knew that only one man had the experience enough to swim uh, in swimming to provide the, the some assistance, and he turned to him for help. But strangely enough, the would-be rescuer calmly watched the man's plight, but made no move to save him. Why don't you do something? they all screamed in unison. Uh, but the man just stood there, apparently unconcerned. After a few moments, the drowning man could stay afloat no longer. His arms and legs grew tired and limp, and he began to sink under water. Now the slow-moving life god dove, dived into the, into the creek and with a few quick strokes reached the man and pulled him to safety. Once all was well, Brother Knee was beside him. How could you stand by and watch your brother drowning, ignoring his cries for help and prolonging his suffering? But the man calmly said, if I were to jump in immediately and try to save a drowning man, he would clutch me in panic and pull me under it with him. In order to be saved, he must come to the end of himself and cease struggling, cease trying to save himself. Only then can he be helped. They were overwhelmed with joy, says the scripture. Notice not fear, not foreboding, not faint-heartedness. This was not just a happy feeling, an expression of elation, the word speaks of a joy as a gift, a deep sense of joy because of who they were about to see. Also notice that as yet they had not entered the house, even before going in, their joy was overwhelming. C.S. <clears throat> Lewis said joy is the serious business of heaven. We seek joy as it would be a magic potion and sometimes we connect it to different goals or achievements. The truth is, joy does not belong to the material, the pragmatic world. It is the inner territory of our hearts which we can visit whenever we want. They entered the house. No turning back, no sign of disappointment having travelled so far. The gospel simply tells us they entered the house. I wonder what their anticipation levels were. Have you travelled somewhere where the hype of the travel, the travel agent's brochures and its eloquence has built up a wonderful picture only to find great disappointment when you finally arrive at your destination? True, we do not really know the status of the Magi. We only know their origin in that they came from the East, but we can surmise that the house of Joseph had secured would have been a lowly affair. Yet what do we read? They knelt and paid homage. The word knelt seems a gentle word, doesn't it? Yet in the original Greek, it has a much stronger meaning. To prostrate oneself, used of supplicants, rendering homage or worship to someone worthy of their devotion. They worshipped and they demonstrated the worthfulness of the child born to be king. True, worship is God-centred worship. People tend to get caught up in where they should worship, what music they should sing in worship, and how their worship looks to other people. Focusing on these things misses the point. Jesus tells us that true worshippers will worship God in spirit and in truth. This means we worship from the heart and the way God has designed. Worship can include praying, reading God's word with an open heart, singing, playing instruments, participating in communion and serving others, all those things. But it is not limited to one of those acts. 
but is done properly when the heart and the attitude of that person are in the right place. It is also important to know that the worship is reserved only for God. The truth is we all worship something and this is why one of the Ten Commandments tells us to worship God alone because it is essential in our relationship with the Lord. What next? Then they opened their gifts and they opened the gifts of gold, frankincense and myrrh. Many are familiar with the traditional symbolism of the three gifts. The gift of gold. Gold is a precious metal and in biblical times was commonly a gift given to kings or those in authority. For the wise men, it was the best gift of what they had and symbolised their realisation that Jesus was not just an earthly king, but was the king of kings. The gift of frankincense. In biblical times, this aromatic resin was used in incense and perfumes. It was very expensive and was used as part of a sacrifice offering and in worship. And the gift of myrrh. Myrrh is another aromatic resin. It has been used throughout history as a perfume, incense and medicine. And in biblical times, it was used to embalm the dead, to mask death itself. It is suggested that the wise men's gift of myrrh symbolised the ultimate bitter sacrifice that Jesus would make his life. But is there another interpretation that can run alongside these traditional meanings? The gifts of gold, frankincense and myrrh say something about the wise men offering to Jesus. Do they symbolise something about the givers and the gift of their entire selves to Jesus Christ? The gift of gold, offering the love of our hearts the best to Jesus. The gift of frankincense, offering the truth in our minds to Jesus. The gift of myrrh, offering the service of our hands to Jesus. The Epiphany story, colourful, dramatic and full of mystery. And the actors are familiar to us. The wise men, the astrologers from the east, far away. Herod, the cruel tyrant. Mary and her child, who is he really, seems to be the question that's coming through the whole of that narrative. Also familiar are the star that intrigued the wise men that guided them to Bethlehem and the gifts the strangers brought. We are invited to become part of this story. Perhaps we can accompany the wise men and ask to share the manifestation, the epiphany that they experienced in Bethlehem. Their journey, like our own lives, involved highs and lows, times of insight and doubt, a dream calling them forward and the deception of worldly values in Herod. But at the end, they were enlightened in the presence of Jesus Christ and they knelt down and paid homage to him. The question is, will we do likewise? For here is the King of kings. Amen. Me
Let's bring our prayers for the church and the world. Let us pray. Holy Creator, you have promised to hear when we pray in the name of your Son. Therefore, in confidence, we trust and we pray for the Church. Creator, enliven the Church for its mission, that we may be salt of the earth and light of the world. Breathe fresh life into your people. Give us your power to reveal Christ in word and action. Creator of all, lead us, every people, into the ways of justice and peace, that we may respect one another in freedom and truth. Awaken in us a sense of wonder for the earth and all that is in it. Teach us to care creatively for its resources. We pray for our communities. God of truth, inspire with your wisdom those whose decisions affect the lives of others, that all may act with integrity and courage. Give grace to all whose lives are linked with ours. May we serve Christ in one another and love as he loves us. We pray for those in need. God of hope, comfort and restore all who suffer in body, mind or spirit. May they know the power of your healing love. Make us willing agents of your compassion. Strengthen us as we share in making people whole. We remember those who have died and those who mourn. We remember with thanksgiving all those who have died in the faith of Christ and those whose faith is known to you alone. Creator, into your hands we commend them. Give comfort to them who mourn. Bring them peace in their time of loss. We praise you for these and all your servants who have entered into your eternal glory. May their example inspire and encourage us. And we pray for ourselves and our ministries. Lord, you have called us to serve you. Grant that we may walk in your presence, your love in our hearts, your truth in our minds, your strength in our wills. Until at the end of our journey we know the joy of our homecoming and the welcome of your embrace through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We sing the hymn, Bethlehem of Noblest Cities.
It's been good to share with the three churches of Totsom, St Nicholas, Exminster and Axminster congregation this morning. And I pray that the peace of the Lord will always be with you. Now may the blessing of God, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit rest and remain with each one of you now and forevermore. Amen.